How we doing? Good, good, good. Good to see all of you. If you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter one. If you don't have one, as always, it's on the screen. If you don't even own one, we'd love to give you one for free out at Next Steps in the lobby. But we've been in this series for the last several weeks now called Advent, looking through Luke chapter one about the stories leading up to Christmas. Because my contention has been that Christmas comes every year and we understand Christmas. We know, even if you didn't grow up going to church, right? You know, something about a you know, big guy in a red and white suit and a baby, you know, eight pounds, six ounces, you know, like, you know, some of it because it, it comes every year and we get so familiar to it. But Advent is a way of lengthening Christmas. It's a way of kind of spreading out and really focusing in on all the events, all the stories that led up to Christmas time. And so we've just been preaching through Luke chapter one, looking at those different stories, how the angel had came to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, and said that his wife, Elizabeth, was going to give birth. And then how the angel came to Mary and said how she was going to give birth, even though she was a virgin. Then last week we saw Mary and Elizabeth talking about that. And this week we're going to see the birth of John the Baptist. So if you have a Bible, like I said, Luke chapter one, we're going to be in verse 57, and then we'll work our way down to verse 66. It says this. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. Now, again, remember the story. Elizabeth is old uh, an older woman. We don't know exactly how old. All we know is that Zachariah said his wife was advanced in years. I guess that's what they said back then instead of old lady. All right. She's advanced in years. All right. Because when Gabriel came to Zachariah, when he was the high priest, he went in to offer sacrifices. The angel comes to him and says, your prayer has been answered. So obviously they had been praying for a kid. He says, your wife is going to give birth. And he says, I don't know if you understand this angel. I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years, right? And he says, well, just because you didn't believe that this was going to happen, I'm going to shut your mouth and she's going to have a son. And so when Zechariah goes home, he can't speak and somehow he communicates to Elizabeth. I don't know. We don't know what he did. Maybe just played a lot of Marvin Gaye music, right? And he goes home and she is, uh, she conceives. You'll get that later. All right. If you have a problem with that, God made sex, not my fault. All right. So she gets pregnant and the Bible says that for five months, she kind of hid herself away because she was really rejoicing and thinking about that because God had taken away her shame. And when we understand how shameful it was in these times to be married and to not have a child, I mean, there's still somewhat of a stigma to it today. If you're older or advanced in years and you don't have a kid, people think there's something wrong with you. But back then it was even more so because a woman's value was associated with that even more. But, but kids were a very important part of the society because there was no retirement plans. There was no government. There was no social security. There was none of that stuff. And so they literally had, did you just clap because there was no social security? Okay. Moving on. Um, and so literally they, they depended upon their kids. We'll get into political views in a minute, all right? They depended upon their kids to the degree that if they didn't have kids, right, they didn't have a lot of hope. And so here they are, advanced in years, and she's pregnant, and now the time has come to give birth. So obviously, Elizabeth is very excited about this. She is very excited, and the reason why we know she's very excited, because the verse tells us, All her neighbors and relatives had heard of the great mercy that the Lord had shown to her. Now, when you read your Bible, you should ask questions. So you ask the question, okay, how did her neighbors and relatives hear? How did they hear about the great mercy? From her, right? We know it wasn't from our boy Zachariah because he couldn't speak. And some of you ladies were like, oh, if I would have had that gift while I was pregnant, that would have been fantastic for my husband not to speak, particularly during the birthing process, right? I'll never forget when Lindsay was pregnant with Jackson and and we didn't go to Lamaze. They didn't have that then. And uh, we weren't, you know, like a lot of you, we weren't giving birth in our bathrooms. And so we went to 
the hospital and we had gone through this kind of training that you listen to classical music while Lindsay was pregnant and that kind of calms the baby, calms her. Uh, and it's, you know, it's true. And, and then you listen to classical music during the birthing process and it's supposed to help. And I was like, okay, sweet. So I come in with my headphones, me, my mother-in-law, Lindsay, and we're there. And I keep trying to put the headphones on Lindsay when it's go time. She's like, I don't want them. I keep trying to put them on. She's like, I don't want them. And she goes, I don't want them. <laughs> Throws them off. And I'm sure at that point, Lindsay would have just loved it if I couldn't speak. Right? So we know that her neighbors and relatives heard about the mercy that God had shown her because she said it. She spoke about the mercy God had shown her. Now, this is important. The reason why this is important is because, and this is my first point, you might want to write this down. Our message is mercy. Our message, the Christian message, the good news is the message of mercy. And our neighbors and our relatives should hear that message because we are speaking that message. But let's be honest. A lot of times, our neighbors and relatives don't hear that message, do they? And I think it's for one of two reasons. One is because we act more like Zechariah than we do Elizabeth. We act like more our mouth is shut. Especially in today's world of political correctness, right? We don't want to say anything offensive. But I want you to understand something. When our message is mercy, that's typically not offensive. Because everybody wants mercy which I think is one of the second reasons why our neighbors and relatives don't know the message. Maybe it's not because we're not speaking. Maybe it's because we're speaking the wrong message. This always bothers me. And I really, especially during my 20s and early 30s, I had to quickly like evaluate what is my message? Because I grew up in ministry working with teenagers and when you work with teenagers, a lot of times your message is not mercy. It's one of judgment and punishment, right? And, 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 and hear me, a lot of times it's, it's correctly motivated because you see kids, you see students, you see all the decisions that they're making and, and you want to help save them from pain and sorrows and mistakes that you had made, right? So you're like, you don't want to go down that road, right? This may happen, this may happen, but we kind of give this message to them like that, that's not really about mercy, not that God is there when they fail, but God's going to get you. And so I really had to take stock of my message and I was coming up in my twenties and preaching and learning what it is that I'm saying. And one day I felt like God really hit me and said, Jason, you're just preaching behaviorism. You're just trying to make these kids behave. And it's not that we shouldn't teach our kids about obedience. Obviously that's one of our values. The Bible speaks a lot about it. But I think so many times and in our effort to be right, we're not very merciful. But see, our message is mercy. That's our message. And it amazes me sometimes how we can take the good news, which is the gospel, the good news of Christ, and we can make it sound like it's bad news. Now, here's where I'll get into talking just a little bit about political stances, all right? Be careful where you clap. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't vote. Absolutely, we should vote. And you should study candidates. You should look at what they believe in, where they stand on things. But here's where I get really fearful sometimes with Christians. Sometimes Christians buy into the fact that change is really going to happen through policy through politics. But is that our message? Is that our message? No. When God sent Jesus, he didn't send a political leader. 
And we know this because the Jews wanted to turn Jesus into a political leader, didn't they? When are you going to restore the kingdom? When are you going to do this? When are you going to vanquish all of our enemies? When are you going to sit on the throne? When can we sit with you at the important seats? And amazingly, Christians still try to do this. When can we have the public square back? Christians, I just needed to let you know something. We lost the public square a long time ago. And we can sit back and curse the darkness all we want. Or we can light a candle. See, our message is mercy. Our message is not a candidate. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. It's not independent. It's not Tea Party. It is Jesus. And if we could vote Jesus, we would, right? But until then, we have to vote for these other candidates. And what I'm saying is this. We can't align ourselves so closely into politics where we buy into this kind of mentality that that's how change happens. And so we get all up in arms about all these kind of political agendas going on. And that becomes our message. And this is why Christians grow so cynical and I get it. Our world creates cynics, doesn't it? Man, it just, it amazes me sometimes the policies that we pass and the things that we, that we say are okay in this country. But if I let the darkness of this country override the brightness of God's mercy, then I don't have a message. The world is only going to get increasingly darker. We need to know that. And no policy and no politician can change that tide. Because the book of Revelation says it. But what can we do? We can become more vocal about our message. Hey, God has shown great mercy. He has shown great mercy. You need to know what he's done for me. And how do we share that? We share our stories. That's what we've been pushing over the last several months to share your story, because that's is that's how your message. That's your message. That's God's mercy in your life. That's your story. And, and some of us, we get it. We get God's mercy, right? Because we know we were bad. Like, like by the world's definition of bad, like we were locked up. We were doing drugs. We were an atheist. We were whatever. And we've got this story how God showed mercy to us. And those are great stories. But there's a lot of you in this room that by the world's definition, you weren't even that bad. You grew up in a Christian home. You made good grades. You graduated. You married pretty well. Your kids are doing pretty well. And, and, and if you're being honest, a lot of times when we share stories, you wrestle because you're like, man, I don't have a story like that. I wasn't that bad. Can I just interject an, another thought for you? Our story is not that we were bad and he made us good. Our story is that we were barren and he made us alive. See, Elizabeth, by all practical accounts, she wasn't bad. I mean, she was the wife of a priest. Right? So you know she was there. You know she was in the service. You know she was there making all the right sacrifices. But she was barren. And because of her barrenness, she had shame. See, what does barren mean? Barren means you can't bring forth. You can't give life. So you want to know why Elizabeth was sharing the story of God's mercy to her neighbors and relatives, not because she was bad, but because God did something in her and for her that she could never have done for herself. And a lot of times, it's the good people who miss that message. Because we think it was because of our goodness that got us in relationship with God. 
But according to Romans 3, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one good. No, not one. I don't care if you went to Christian private school. I don't care where your kids grow up. They're not good. And you may not see it, but the rest of us do. It's not about badness. It's about barrenness. We couldn't bring forth the word of God in our hearts. And this is why Jesus railed against religious sin more so than he did irreligious sin. Because we all get irreligious sin. No one's going to say, I'm going to light up this cocaine to the glory of God. Right? I don't even know if you light up cocaine. I never did illegal drugs. And it wasn't I was so good. I just had a big father. All right. But, but you see what I'm saying? Oh, but you can be in church and you can be good and go straight to hell. Why? Because you don't have a message of mercy. This is why I think a lot of people who are in church for a long time, they don't grow more merciful. They grow less. Why? Because they don't understand the gravity by which they've been saved. They don't understand that Jesus came and died on a cross for them. You were, listen, you were so bad. God had to die. You were so barren, so dead. God had to die. That's your message. But oh, you were so loved and so chosen that he chose to die. See, the point is not to highlight your particulars of the story. You see what I'm saying? The point is to highlight the message of the story, which is mercy. And every single one of us have been shown mercy if we are in Christ. That's the message. And her neighbors and relatives heard it. That's got to be our message, Christians. Now let's continue. Verse 59. It says, and on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, for he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. Now, again, I say this often. Not only should we ask questions of the Bible, but we need to get the comedy of the Bible. The Bible is a book of tragedies and comedies and everything in between. But I read this story and I immediately kind of start laughing. I don't know if you picked up on it, but here's what was funny to me. Elizabeth has a they in her life. Elizabeth has a they. Like I read this story and, and, and this child is Elizabeth's and John and Zacharias, right? By declaration of the angel. So the angel made the decision about what this child would be and who this child's name was. And then they show up. And I look at this and I think, who do they think they are? It says they would have called him Zachariah after his father. Oh, really? When has the neighbors and relatives ever named the child? Last time I checked, that was the parents' prerogative. And we know this because some of the names y'all pick for your child, you should have chosen wisely. Chose wisely. You took blue pill, should have took the red one, man. We don't get some of the names. But you, that's your prerogative. But even Elizabeth and Zechariah didn't get to choose because Gabriel said this is what his name is. And then they show up and they start trying to tell Elizabeth what she should name her own child. Really? I would just like to submit to you, if you're that involved in someone else's life, that's too involved. You do not get to have an argument with the parents about what they are going to name their kids. And I love how Elizabeth stands up. And she has to. You don't see in a second, Zachariah can't speak. She says, no. The child will be called John. And here's what I've realized. All of us have a they in our life. All of us have a they. 
I found out early on in ministry as I was, you know, learning how church works because I didn't grow up in church and, and, and maybe that was some of God's mercy to me. And so kind of as I was new in, in my 20s in church and, and, and for whatever reason, God's just given me leadership positions and responsibilities. It's all his mercy. And, and so I would, I would, I'm normally in situations that are over my head. Like, like even, now, even leading this church, I'm too young and too immature to lead this church, but God in his mercy has placed me here. And I learned early on in ministry that when you make decisions, they are going to come to you. And I'll never forget early on in my twenties, somebody came to me and, and said this, Hey, they've been talking and here's what they're saying. And I immediately thought, what? They are? Oh no. Then we shouldn't do that if they don't like it. And so I would capitulate. Oh, okay, okay. This is what they say. Then we won't do that. And I did that enough times where later in my 20s, when I was leading a student ministry by myself, and they showed up again. Literally, I felt God say, hey, Jason, ask him or her who they are. I said, hey, let me ask you a question. Who's they? We know a lot of people. Like people that go to church here? Yeah. So do those, those people have names? Well, yeah. Well, I need you to tell me their names. Oh, I can't do that. They would be mad. Well, if they have names and they have opinions, then why aren't they here talking to me? And you know what I would normally find out? They was two or three people. Two or three people. Maybe it was 10 sometimes. And then I started this rule. Anytime somebody comes to me and says, they, my first time out, hold up, stop right now. Who's they? I'm not going to listen to anything you say about they until they have names. Oh, give me names because when you give me their, and I'm not being mean, this is mercy. When you give me their names, I'm going to have a conversation with them because apparently if they are talking, then they need to talk to me. And almost always they would either shut that down or I'd have a conversation with somebody and maybe it was a legitimate concern, but it was based on misunderstandings or things that had happened that weren't true or something that they had told they, because there's multiple days. <laughs> and we'd either work it out or I would say, you're wrong. This is even happening in volunteer teams, even it happens on staff. Hey, I don't know if you know this, but they have been talking about you. Well, they are wrong and you're on a power play and we don't play power plays here. We're a family. Our family. And, and this is not how families operate. I don't go to my wife and say, hey, they've been talking. Who's they? Is two midgets running around in the house? They. I don't, I don't do that. This is not how life happens. But somehow, somehow in Christian culture, we have spiritualized the they's. Use your name. When we get a comment card, this happens very rarely. When we get a comment card that's critical with anonymous, we have a holy shredder moment. <laughs> See you. Because they're not dignified to use their name, we're not dignified to read it. And, and, and hear me, hear me. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that when someone comes to you with a legitimate concern that we shouldn't have mercy. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we can never compromise the truth. 
You see how Elizabeth said no? He shall be called John. Why did Elizabeth stand on that statement? You know why she stood on that statement? Because the angel gave it to her husband. It was the truth. And what I'm saying to you is this. In our message of mercy, we are never called to compromise the truth. The Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and full of, anybody know? Uh, I see why you did that, but no. Full of truth. He was full of grace and truth. Not 50 50, 100 100. He wasn't half grace, half truth. He was all grace, all truth. Jesus, arguably the most merciful and graceful human being ever to walk this planet because he was God in the flesh, did he ever compromise on truth? No. If he would have, he would have sinned. And the Bible says he was without sin. Interestingly enough, one of the most favorite titles that the gospel writers use of Jesus is friend of, anybody know? Sinners. That was much better than the last time. I, that was a softball right there, all right? Friend of sinners. So did Jesus ever sin in order to be a friend of sinners? No. No. And this is what I'm, my professor told me this. I use it all the time. On either side of the road is a ditch. And here's normally what happens with Christians. We either go over into this ditch of all truth, no grace. All truth, no grace. That's the, that's the, the person who has no mercy. That's the rigid Christian. That's the doomsday Christian who says this is all going to hell in a handbasket. Run for the hills, right? No mercy left. Or we go over into this ditch, it's all grace and no truth. But you can't have grace without truth. And you can't have truth without grace. We are called to live in the middle, which means we are not called to capitulate the truth. But we are not called to say the truth in an unloving way. So it bugs me sometimes when Christians think they have to act like sinners in order to have credibility with sinners. Churches and pastors have even done this. I'm like, if, there, if there's no line between you and the people you're trying to reach, then maybe you need to be reached too. Jesus never sinned, yet he was a friend of sinners. Full of truth, full of grace. So when our message is mercy, we do not have to compromise on the truth. Elizabeth didn't compromise on the truth. She said, no, that's not what he's going to be called. And it was in the midst of the conversations with her crazy neighbors and relatives that she said the mercy. See, a lot of us think, man, if I just wasn't around these crazy people, I'd have more mercy. No, because it's in the presence of those crazy people that God has called you to have mercy. You, you wouldn't be able to have mercy unless you didn't have that wacko family or, or that person who's walking away from the truth. Those are the people we are called to show mercy to and show it in such a way where we're not compromising on the truth. Watch how this family reacts. Watch how these neighbors react. Look to the next verse, verse 62. Like this story gets even stranger. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. So apparently what the mother said wasn't enough. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, remember, because he can't speak. His name is John. And they all wondered. If your life isn't making they wonder, then you're not living it right. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loose and he spoke, blessing God. See, I read this story again and I just kind of laugh because here's the naming of their son that they are involving themselves in. They, they have no right to involve themselves in. And then Mary says no, and they don't like that answer. So they go to the dad. Now in that day, the dad had a lot more authority than in our day today. But I imagine Zachariah would have said what most dads say today, what she said. You think I had any way to name this kid what I wanted? I mean, this is what most dads are like, dude, my mouth is shut. I don't get a, I don't get a say in this. And she reminded me, 
I got the fun part. She got the nine months of pain. She gets to name him. I just laugh at this situation because I'm looking at John, uh, Zachariah and thinking, and he's like, man, I don't got, his name's John. Not just because my wife said so, because the angel said so. And my wife is submitted to the angel. His name is John. But then the neighbors <laughs> and the friends and the relatives are like, hey, Zachariah, what do you think? And they all wondered. Hmm. Wow. What a dysfunctional group of neighbors and relatives that they are trying to name. Like they are, their lives are so lame, they're trying to name another kid's child. But hear me. It was in the midst of that situation that God called Zechariah and Elizabeth to show mercy. See, when we go to these holiday seasons, families and neighbors start acting weird, don't they? We got a lot of weird traditions, and I get it. You got to travel. You got to drive 10 hours to spend two hours with people you don't even really like. And you may say, man, if it wasn't for this crazy family, I'd have a good holiday. Let me just tell you something about your crazy family. You need to remind yourself how you got into the family. See, you got into the family of God by mercy. And if we can't show mercy to the family members that drive us the craziest, to the neighbors and the relatives who are over-involving themselves. We are not saying they're not. They are. And warning, when you're a grandparent, you will too. You will over-involve yourself probably or under-involve yourself. You're not going to get it right. But don't you want to be shown mercy? See, we all think showing mercy is being nice to people who are nice to us. But what did Jesus say about that? He said, even the sinners and tax collectors do that. I say, love your enemies. And sometimes, sadly, our enemies are our families, are our neighbors, are our relatives. And it's in those messy situations that mercy has to infiltrate. And they need to hear about the mercy God has shown you. Mercy always costs you something. You need to know that. It was not free for God to give mercy to you. And it will not be free for God to get mercy through you. It will cost you. It will be painful. It will be hard. Because you might be right But you have to be humble. See, no relationship works if mercy is not the currency. Husbands and wives, have you figured that one out yet? Oh, you can be right and you can go to bed right and you can lay there rightly justified. And you're going to bed with a loser. I just realized a long time ago, for the sake of the relationship, I'd rather lose. Oh, I might be right, and I might know I'm right. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You say, man, I can't, I can't do that. I can't. Yeah, you can. If God has shown you mercy. If he hasn't shown you mercy, you're right, you can't. But if he has shown you mercy, then you just remind yourself how you too were an enemy of God. See, in the midst of this crazy dynamic, they're showing mercy. And then what happens next? Look at this, verse 65. And fear came on all their neighbors. So they go from wondering to fear. Now this fear isn't like fear of spiders. It's like, oh, what? Like They go from wondering to worship. All. 
We know that because look at this. It says, and all these things were talked about all throughout the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. So they go from wondering to worshiping and asking questions. We must live our life in such a way where we dispense mercy so much that people start to ask questions. If we're not living our life in such a way where people are asking questions as to why we're, at, why we're acting the way that we are, then we're doing it wrong. When your coworker owes you and you step in and you say, no, you don't owe me anymore. This isn't I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. I don't care if you ever scratch mine again. I'm going to do this for you. When your friend is the one who made the mistake and you step in and say, no, it was my fault. And your friend says, why would you do that? When your marriage is to the point where you're just fighting and fighting and fighting and you know you were right. And you go to them and you say, I'm sorry. And the other person is expecting you to come with a laundry list. And you tear it up and say, that doesn't matter because I love you more than being right. So when we live like that, they ask questions. What? What then will this child be? See, Zechariah and Elizabeth lived their life in such a way where their neighbors and relatives were asking questions about this child. And who is this child? He's John the Baptist. And I don't have time to go over all this. I just want to read you this one thing. It's not even on the screen. This is Zechariah's response to his child after he can speak. If you have your Bible, you can just skip on down to verse 76 through 79. Listen to what Zechariah says about this child. He says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Now listen to verse 78. Because of the tender mercy of our God. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. See, they're living their life in such a way where they're asking questions about this child. And who was this child? This child was one who was to go out and speak about the truth of what Jesus was going to do. He was going to be a prophet of the Most High. He was going to say how God came to forgive their sins. He was going to shine a light in the darkness. See, your greatest contribution may not be something you do. It may be someone you raise. But they lived their life in such a way where they were asking a question about a child. Friends, what else is the story of Christmas but a story of a baby, of a child who because of the tender mercy of God was coming into the world to forgive people of their sins. And somewhere along the way, we've lost that message. And not only have we lost that message, but we haven't been acting that way so here's my point to you. Live in such a way, live in such a way that others see the effects of God's mercy and God's hand in your life. That's my last point. I'd write it down if I were you. Live in such a way where others see the effects. And I don't know if it's a apex or efex, whatever is supposed to be right. I'm sorry. I just know something happened. 
live in such a way where others see the effects of God's mercy and God's hand in your life. See, these neighbors and relatives said, who will this child be for the Lord's hand was on him? He's eight days old and they already see the effect of God's hand on his life. Because Luke 1.15 tells us he was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Let that one just mess your brain up. See, God's hand, it's not so much about like literally God's hand. It's a, it's a metaphorical phrase. And, and God's hand literally means this. The, the phrase literally translates the controlling influence of. The controlling influence of. So we know that God's word is Jesus Christ. And I think that God's hand is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Because Luke tells us he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And now the neighbors recognize God's hand is on him. Even at that age, which is the controlling influence of God, which that's how he controls is through his spirit. So you could say it like this, live your life in such a way where others see the effects of God's mercy and God's controlling influence on your life. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for the last couple weeks and how he came on them and how they were filled with the Holy Spirit and how we saw the effects of it. What I'm saying is this. God's mercy was displayed in his son, Jesus Christ. And God's hand is displayed through his spirit. The controlling influence on your life. And the result of the Holy Spirit on your life, Paul tells us in Galatians 5, is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That's a result of God's hand. That's a result of God's spirit. So if you say, man, I, I just can't be merciful. Then if you can't be merciful, here's the problem. You're not underneath his controlling influence. You're not underneath the spirit. You're not in the spirit. You're not filled with the spirit. And some of you here, maybe you've never trusted Christ before. And what I'm saying to you is news to you because of God's mercy to you. Not that you had to be good. But you just had to admit you're barren. You can do nothing and God will do it. He will bring forth. He will give birth to new life in you. But then there's a lot of us here. Again, we know the story. But we're just not very merciful. And the reason why we're not very merciful is because God's controlling influence hasn't been the primary influence. So we have to submit again to his hand, to his spirit. And say, would you produce love and joy and peace and patience and kindness? Because that is what causes neighbors and relatives to ask questions. When you face a situation where you should not have peace and yet you have peace. Your neighbors come to you and say, man, why aren't you mad? You just lost your job and you didn't do anything wrong. Go postal on a man. You're like, no, man, I got peace. Why? Man, he just hit you. Why don't you hit him back? No, I'm called to turn the other cheek. I'm going to walk away. How do you have such self-control? How do you not go on Twitter and create a fake account and blast them? You know, anonymous getting them. My gosh. If you do that, I just want to let you know you are lame. How do you not respond? How do you not do that? Man, I want to. But God's controlling hand can't. Because that's not what he did with me. You see what I'm saying? Church, if we got a message like that, that message will go throughout all Judea. And this Christmas Eve, we have that opportunity to show that message, to invite people out. Next year in our Seek and Save campaign, we've got all kinds of opportunities to invite people out. But why would people want to come if their thought of a Christian is you? 
If the thought of Jesus making them into something new looks like you, would that be attractive to them? Think about it. When we live our life like that, that's attractive. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this message, this message of mercy. And as Christians, God, especially in a corrupt culture, nine times out of 10, we are right. Nine times out of 10, we are morally right. Because we're, we're getting our morals not from a shifting sand. We're getting them from the rock, from the word. But God, so many times as Christians, even though we were morally right, we were bankrupt in terms of mercy. And so God, help us, instead of cursing the darkness, to light a candle. Help us to, to be the message of mercy to our neighbors and to our relatives, especially over these holidays. God, it's, it's hard to show mercy, but we can't do it unless we're filled with the Spirit. We can't do it unless we're under the control of your hand. So help us to admit our shortcomings and ask for more of the Holy Spirit so that we can display those fruit. And God, as we do it, I pray people would come to faith in you. People would go from wonder to worship because they're asking questions about this child. Help us to live our life like that. God, and I pray if there's anybody in this room who doesn't know Jesus, right now where you're Sitting, if you don't know him, the message is mercy to you. And if you repent and confess now, you'll get mercy. But after he comes, you will only get judgment. So move while mercy is available. We have response team people down front, and that's just men and women who would love to pray with you, love to talk with you. If there's something going on, if you need to move even now, come down front. And that's our message. God has mercy. And he loves you because he came for you. And then those of us who have Christ, let that always be our message. Yes, we're full of truth. We're not going to compromise. But we have to be full of grace. We have to show mercy. We have to love extravagantly to the point where people ask questions. Why would you do that? So we can give them the answer for the hope that we have. God, I pray that you bless our Christmas Eve services. I pray hundreds of people will come to faith in you. And next year, as we evaluate the end of this year and think about next year and what we're doing as a church, we ask you to draw people to yourself but help us to be the right kind of billboards going out with that message of mercy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. We'll see you Christmas Eve.